kör jag. All right. Uh, so uh, my name is Robert Söderbjörn. Uh, I'm going to be talking about building a, um, an Android UI using declarative programming uh, in Jetpack Compose. Uh, so Jetpack Compose is a declarative uh, programming framework in the same tradition as React for the web or Swift UI for iOS. I lied actually a little bit. Uh, it's not just for Android. Uh, it's for iOS, uh, sorry, a desktop and web as well. So I'll mention some problems uh, with building classic UIs on Android uh, and what the new future looks like with Kotlin and Compose. Uh, and finally, I will go through some sample code uh, and a sample app as well. So uh, I'm a software developer at Bontouch. Uh, we build native mobile apps uh, like these uh, in close cooperation with our partners, uh, of course, and man actually many other uh, native apps as well. We're not a resource and consulting company, so you can't hire an, a developer uh, on an hourly basis to work at a customer location. Instead, we work from our studios, uh, where we have many product teams like this that developers can move between. Uh, we have good relationships with Apple and Google, uh, so we can be at the bleeding edge of mobile uh, technology. Also things like voice apps. Our main office is a few minutes walk from this venue. So I'd like to ask you something. Uh, can you raise your hands if you have at least one of these apps installed? Maybe two or more apps? Okay, that's quite a sizable portion. So I'm going to take you on a journey. Uh, I will be talking about some challenges that I have faced when building user interfaces. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how a new framework that I started playing with uh, is starting to help me overcome these challenges. That framework is called Jetpack Compose. Uh, and then the journey that I'm in right now, it's primarily in the world of Android. Uh, and some of the challenges that I mentioned might apply to your world as well. Or maybe they don't. But as a, as a developer, fellow developer, I'm sure you can empathize if my job becomes easier and more fun. And perhaps it can make your job more fun as well. So now for a disclaimer. Uh, this is not going to be a deep dive. Uh, I won't mention everything there is to know about this framework. Mainly, I want to spark your interest. And throughout this journey, I will be uh, showing some code samples in Kotlin, which is the standard uh, Android programming language these days. How many people here are somewhat familiar or comfortable with Kotlin? OK, that's quite many. Uh, and out of those who are not as familiar, uh, how many people think it will be rocket science to understand some basic Kotlin? OK, so not too many people think it's, it's going to be a uh, difficult thing. And of course, you're right. Uh, it's going to be quite easy, so don't focus too much on um, you know, minor syntax. I don't think it will uh, take away from the main points that I want to make. So declaring the UI. So when I build an Android UI, uh, this is how I start. And this is how most people building uh, native apps for Android start. Uh, I create an XML file uh, declaring a, the user interface components that I want to have. And I put this inside various layouts so that they get positioned where I want them and grow in the way that I want them to as well. And these XML files can grow quite large. And for me, this is the first pain point already. I don't want to use XML. So much clutter and ceremony with namespaces and stuff. But that's just the way it is. So now I want to toggle the visibility on some component based on some condition. So what is going on in this code? Uh, well, first, using Kotlin, uh, I programmatically search for a custom uh, widget uh, called payment plan table. And if some condition is true, then I change the visibility of this uh, widget programmatically. Or here's another example. I find a container in my XML file, and then I iterate over something. Uh, and for every iteration, I inflate another XML file and add it to the container. So inflating uh, just means loading and parsing the XML. Uh, and then I search for a component, in this case a text view, inside of the inflated view, and then I change it. So this is my second pain point. I have to declare my original components and layout using XML files uh, far away from the code that actually handles the UI. Uh, 
So there's one way to declare the UI and another way to programmatically change it. So two different languages and, and two different mental models. So now for state management. Uh, maybe you encountered a pattern like this with some UI library that you might have used. And this is what I used to do in some UI libraries in the old days. So the user clicks a checkbox, uh, and we intercept this change uh, and see if we will allow it based on some condition. Turns out we're not allowed to check it, so we uncheck it programmatically. Or maybe this case is more realistic. We attach a listener for any changes, uh, and our return value from our view model can uh, tell it to cancel the operation. And this is, of course, better. There's not going to be any flickering, uh, but it doesn't feel amazing. Well, here's yet another example where in pseudocode, where I uh, display a button, but I need to carry out different actions depending on whether it already exists or not. And the reason this kind of code feels annoying is because there's no single source of truth. So what I mean by that is the, the UI lives, uh, the UI components own their own state. Uh, state doesn't live in the, uh, your code, it lives in the UI. So in addition to your own state, you have to keep track of the actual true state inside of the components. And sometimes the current state of the UI uh, affects the way that you need to uh, change the UI to get it to the state you want. And as your application grows, it's pretty much guaranteed to become a mess. Uh, maybe you live with this mess for so long that you don't even uh, recognize it anymore. Uh, like when I peek into my six-year-old daughter's bedroom, uh, stuff lying all over the place. Uh, you can't walk there anymore without getting hurt. Uh, but I keep telling myself, this is not so bad. It could be even worse. So what about scrolling lists? Uh, imagine you have something like this for, on Android. It's a scrolling list of items with different types uh, of items. Uh, in this case, it's a logo and it's uh, headers and employees. And you might think it's pretty easy to set up something like this in, a, in an app. Uh, most apps have lists like this, and some apps have many. But it actually requires a lot of effort. Uh, the Android view system is quite old and slow, so you have to set up something called a recycle view to get decent performance when you have many items. So you need a whole bunch of things. You need an adapter, a bunch of constants, and layout files and view holders. Uh, and you need to set up a mechanism to actually find and animate changes because that is important in a mobile app, to have kind of a fluid experience with animations and things like that. It makes, makes a big difference to the end user experience. Uh, I'm not going to through, go through all of the code needed for this, of course, uh, but it's about 15 files just to set up this simple scrolling list. And if you thought that was bad enough, you even actually have to consider uh, how you lay out your views, because since the system is quite old and slow, you might not be able to use the most intuitive approach uh, so here are the files, by the way. So it's a lot of stuff, and I think you can guess what my uh, fourth pain point is. Of course, it's that it's so much work to set up scrolling lists that have decent performance. And it's quite error prone as well, so if you mix up some constants somewhere, uh, you might get a bug. Um, so I made a reason that traditional Android UI development is so messy is because Android is old, it's already 15 years old. Um, so how do we get from where we are today to where we want to be in the future? Uh, so Google thinks we get there through Jetpack Compose. Uh, and at OneTouch, uh, many of the apps that we build together with our partners already use Jetpack Compose in production. So what is Jetpack Compose? Uh, the simple way to describe it is that, it, that it's a UI framework. Uh, in fact, it's the new UI framework for Android. Uh, it was released last summer and replaces this uh, ancient system that's been used since the dawn of time. And Compose is a very big deal in the Android community. Uh, it works only with Kotlin, uh, which is fine because most Android developers have been using more or less only Kotlin for years anyway and it's the recommended language for Android. Uh, Compose has been an alpha and beta releases for years, and me and my colleagues have been uh, trying this out for, for a good while now. 
So what I said actually is somewhat of a simplification. Uh, it's actually a framework for managing state, state trees to be precise. And it's a UA framework. And, and some people like Jake Wharton, who is a well-known uh, profile in the ANU developer community, have built quite interesting things on top of Compose with purely the part of Compose that deals with state. Uh, we won't go into that, to that today, however. Uh, but for, of course, most people will think of Compose as, as purely a UA framework. So with this background, uh, one thing that is also useful to know about Compose is that it does not map to classic native elements. Uh, it does its own rendering in its own canvas and piecing together things like lines and rectangles and other primitives uh, to, to make up the UI. So it's effectively a complete reboot of Android UI from the ground up. It's a little bit like Swing, which doesn't use the previous native components in, on Windows or Mac, for example. But the difference is Compose is becoming the official new UI. So it's shouldn't be a, an issue. So uh, and updates have been a problem traditionally on Android devices. Uh, Compose is actually distributed with your app. So it's like any other statically linked dependency that you might have. So you can support pretty old phones since there's no dependency on anything that is on the device other than Android. It's also a Kotlin compiler plugin, uh, which generates code that allows a Compose to pull off its magic. And you'll see some of that magic later on. Finally, it's an IDE plugin to be able to preview your components uh, inside of your IDE. Uh, you can mix and match between the old views and the new views. It's quite easy. So it's the kind of uh, threshold to start using Compose is, is very low. So uh, how many people in this audience are Android developers? OK, there's a few. Uh, but most people are not. Uh, and you might be glad to hear that this talk could still be relevant to you, because you can actually write desktop apps for uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, as an alternative to using something like AWT or Swing. Uh, or you can even use, use it to build web apps. Uh, I think this is kind of in an early stage, so I can't vouch for how well it actually works. But we have been trying out some uh, experiments with the desktop version of Compose, at least. So uh, Google built Compose, but JetBrains is building it for desktop and web. And you can use most of the same components on desktop as you can use uh, on Android. Uh, and with Kotlin multi-platform, you can even have a single product that generates an Android build and a desktop build. Uh, and there are native bindings, so you can access things like notifications and uh, menus and things like that. So I'm not going to get into any depth on Kotlin, uh, but there are some language features that make this language particularly well suited to something like Compose. So imagine you want to describe a robot like this one uh, through a sequence of chain function calls. So essentially, uh, you want to create a DSL. Uh, that is a domain-specific language uh, for describing a robot. And you want to describe the size of the head and what it contains, color of the eyes, and so on. So how could you create a framework for this uh, in Kotlin? So let's look at this code sample, which is a framework for describing a robot. I left out the implementation details, as the declaration is actually more interesting at this point. So the robot function takes another function as argument. Uh, it's a function that returns no value. Unit is like the void type in other OO languages. And the head function uh, receives a size, expressed as a custom type called centimeters, as well as, again, a function describing what is inside or on the head. And this could be, for example, an antenna or eyes or a mouth. And the eyes function takes the color of the eyes as a custom type and also has a default color if no, uh, no value is provided. And here we see something interesting as well. Uh, in Kotlin, you can declare an extension function on an existing type so that you can enhance it in a comfortable way. And you can do that even for the built-in times like uh, primitives like int. In this case, it's not actually a function. It's, 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 a, it's a value with a getter, but it's the same principle. But it means you won't have, need to have any parentheses in the code. Uh, 
So now we have what it takes to declare a robot in a nice DSL with the antenna and mouth and the head and so on. Uh, and the head being five centimeters. And because the robot function has no uh, required arguments other than the function parameter, Kotlin allows you to omit any parentheses in the function call, and you can just put the brackets. And also because the last argument to head was a function, Kotlin allows you to put that argument outside of the parentheses before the brackets. So it's nice and clean. So what you see here are nested function calls, uh, passing lambdas to each other. But it looks more like declarative programming uh, than imperative programming. And we're actually indirectly building a tree of items with different properties and trillion associated with it, each item. And this is how you describe your layout and UI in Compose as well. So, from other UI frameworks, you might be used to representing a component, like a button or a piece of text, uh, as a class. In Compose, that's not the case. Everything is, uh, is a function uh, annotated by at Composable. Uh, so inside the Composable, you call other Composables to build your UI tree. Here I created a Hello World component uh, as a Composable function, and it takes a number to put inside the message. You can see the component having a text view inside of it. And then in my screen, uh, I have a for loop uh, that calls the hello component five times, except if it's number three. So you can see the if statements, uh, statement inside the for loop. Uh, and it's important to note here that although this looks like markup, it's real Kotlin code that is being executed. So you can use all of the same constructs that you're used to, uh, like loops and conditions. Another thing I wanted to highlight uh, is that my hello component takes a modifier as a parameter that it sets on the text. And in my calling code, I specify a modifier that changes the padding and the background of the hello message. So this is, this is common practice when you build um, a composable function. Uh, you expose a modifier that the outside world can, uh, can use to customize it in different ways. Um, compose functions are meant to take other compose functions as arguments, like pieces of a puzzle. So the button component that comes with compose uh, doesn't specify what the button should look like, or it only kind of represents the behavior that is a button, and that you can click on it, and what you put inside of it is up to you. In this case, what we put inside the button is a column uh, containing a text and an image, when you click on it, and it will display kind of this ripple effect that it's called. Uh, Compose, does, Compose doesn't care what the button looks like, it only cares about the behavior. So now it's time to back out for a bit and, and talk about some of the fundamental, fundamental concepts to be aware of. Uh, the Compose compiler plugin analyzes what function produces a specific part of the UI tree. Because it knows this, uh, and it knows what input each function depends on. Uh, it will automatically call the correct composable function when your UI needs to be updated. And it can call your composable function at any time, any number of times, uh, completely independently, fr independently from your own call graph. So it can call functions that you did not call uh, without the parent function being called. And if the arguments in state did not update, Compose can skip executing the function completely. Uh, so all of this is safe because composable functions should not have side effects, uh, at least not normally. So you have to take these things into account when you uh, write your code. Um, in Compose, you own the state, the UI component doesn't own the state. So for a text input field, for example, you have to provide the initial value, and as the user is typing, you have to update the source of truth so that Compose will call your composable function again and again to re-render the contents of the text field. And it's the same principle with other things, things like checkboxes, where, you know, and even with something like a scroll state that holds kind of a representation of where you are inside a scrollable list. But you can't use a regular variable, like in this example, inside your composable function to hold the value of the text field. So, because if you did, it would get reinitialized to this default value every time you call it. And as I mentioned, Compose can call your function any number of times. And if you were to do something like initialize uh, maybe a value to a, a random number, uh, it's the same thing. Every time the composable function gets called, you will get a new random number 
So you can't do it exactly like this. You, you have to create the state in some other way. So how do you do it? Now this is one way to do it. Uh, you create an observable state by calling the mutable state of a function. Uh, this returns an implementation of a state interface, which has magic powers within the composed runtime. Then you make sure to retain this value across recompositions by using the remember keyword. So you do the mutable state of, and you use the remember keyword. Uh, and you can use this mechanism for any type of value. Uh, and this is what makes it possible to build an interactive UI uh, on top of a world with pure functions. Here's another example of a state. So we made a column scrollable, uh, but the scroll state, uh, the thing that keeps track of where we are inside the list, uh, we have to initialize it and provide it from the outside. This is a good thing because it means we are in control. Uh, and it makes it, easy, makes it easier to reason about the control flow as well. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you make this into a lazy column instead of a normal column, uh, then it will only render the items as needed as you are scrolling. So it's much easier than the recycle view example that I showed you in the beginning. In fact, you can replace all of those 15, lines, uh, 15 files that I showed you uh, with about 100 lines of pretty simple and straightforward compose code. There are other ways to create state as well. Uh, for example, Com Compose can interoperate with RxJava or Kotlin coroutine flows. Uh, how many people here have used like a reactive uh, library like RxJava or coroutines? Quite many. Cool. Uh, so it's kind of familiar territory to quite a lot of people at least. So because Compo Compose can restart your composable function at any time, uh, they shouldn't have any side effects normally, like I mentioned. Uh, if a function is called again and again with the same input, uh, it should produce the same value. Uh, and you shouldn't put any arbitrary code inside a composable because at least it shouldn't do anything other than emitting UI. Uh, so it's, it's a big no-no to do asynchronous calls, uh, like for, um, for example, because uh, when it's re recompositioned, I just gonna uh, call it again and again. But sometimes you need to escape this declarative model. And there's a, call, a construct called launched effect that you can use to carry out some execution logic that outlives the composition cycle. And you have to provide a key to uniquely identify the operation that is being uh, performed. And in this case, I wanna uh, make a call to scroll my lazy list to the bottom. And this is an asynchronous call that I wouldn't normally be able to carry out inside a composable. Other cases where you might want to use something like this is, for example, subscribing to some reactive stream of one-off events rather than state, because you can't model one-off events as state, really. Uh, in that case, you might also, also use this mechanism. So for some basic uh, best practices, uh, UI components shouldn't generally access data from the view model. Uh, they should take the state they need as parameter in the kind of most primitive type of form they need it. Um, and this is referred to as state hoisting, and it's quite important in the Compose world. Uh, and similarly, UI components shouldn't call functions on the view model directly to communicate events. Uh, they should take a function parameter uh, and call the function instead, and let, let, let the event be handled as high up as possible in the chain. Of course, this is to promote usability, re, or rather reusability. So to summarize, uh, you write the UI uh, as if you were building it from scratch every time. Uh, Compose will monitor changes uh, to any state that you depend on automatically and re-render your tree or parts of your tree. And this is called a recomposition, uh, and it will apply some clever optimizations that I mentioned, so that it won't render more things than are actually needed. So if you don't remember uh, anything else out of this presentation, uh, I, I, it should be this. Describe what the UI should look like and not how to get there. The frameworks take care of state updates and so on. So now we are ready to return to our pain points. Uh, we don't have to use XML anymore. We use Kotlin all the way. Uh, you only need to specify the UI once as a functional state. 
And doing uh, scrolling lists has become trivial. You can just specify what to display instead of wiring up, wiring up a bunch of boilerplate code, code all over the place. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a code sample now. And I won't go through all of the code, just some interesting pieces. And you can find the full code on GitHub if you want to check it out in more detail. Uh, I did the UI design on my own, which means there's not much of a design. My, my kids might as well have done it. Uh, and I took some uh, shortcuts to keep focus. Uh, the main shortcut that I took is I don't apply theming very well. Uh, so I specify certain properties all over the place. But this is also to kind of illustrate how Compose, uh, how you can use Compose to achieve certain results. So kind of made it to uh, whet your appetite a bit. So um, as you can see, I'm using Android Studio. Does it look OK, by the way, the colors and stuff? You can see it? OK, cool. Um, so this demo application, it's a scrolling list of items. Uh, it's actually uh, a list of the coworkers that I brought with me today. Um, and you can see how many seconds each person has been employed. So you can see it updating constantly. Uh, and you can click on an employee for a detailed view like this. Uh, with has some additional notes, and you can you can type them here, and it changes instantly. Uh, you can also click uh, this logo to show a secret menu that allows you to display many items. So if you click many items, you get this large list, very large list. Uh, you can also sc uh, slow down the animations, and I have two types of animations at least in this app. Uh, one is uh, the car that I click on is going to expand to fill the entire screen like this. And also, if you look at the title bar, uh, it has a crossfade applied to it. Actually, I'm going to type here while it's slowing down as well, just for fun. So uh, how could you build an app like this uh, in Compose? Uh, well, uh, let's start with the logo for JFocus. And it simply has uh, an image with some modifiers um, and then a hard-coded uh, image resource. And uh, note also this function uh, at preview. This tells Android Studio to render the composable uh, in the window to the right, so you can kind of see what you're working on. Uh, we have a very similar um, logo here. Uh, I think the main difference is that we apply uh, the clickable modifier, so we can intercept uh, changes. Uh, so we, we can intercept the, the, the click events. Uh, we have the team view, which is the team header. It's quite similar as well. Um, the logo might be null, so this is the way in Kotlin that we check if it's not null, since Kotlin enforces nullability. Uh, and we have the JFocus toolbar. Let's see if I can see the design for this one. That part didn't work so well, actually. Um, so this is where we apply the crossfade. So we either want to display the employee details title with the back button, or we want to display the main title. So we use the crossfade, uh, crossfade keyword in Compose. We provide this target state that we depend on, which in this case is whether we are showing employee details or not. Then we specify an animation to, to carry out. Um, so in this case, it's, um, it's, it's, it's what is called a tween, which is uh, kind of a curve-based animation that slows down towards the end. Then inside our Lambda, we, we receive the state again, and we can do an if statement on it and then simply emit the UI that we want to have in these two situations, and Compose will do the crossfade for us. Uh, this stuff is pretty straightforward, I think. It's a row with an icon button, and inside the icon button there's an icon and a box and so on. 
So um, we also need the something called a scaffold. Uh, this is simply the kind of top level uh, view inside your screen that looks like this. Uh, it has a title bar um, and so on. Uh, it's uh, nothing special in this code, I think. But now for something more interesting. Uh, you remember how in multiple places we had the employee uh, seconds. Uh, and for example, in this list, we display uh, for how long each person has been employed. And we do it in this uh, detail view as well. And in addition, uh, this detail view also displays uh, how many seconds um, this view has been open. So it makes sense to build some, some kind of reusable component to handle this. So I built one. Uh, it's called Elapsed Time View. So you provide it with a start time, for example, a local date time. Uh, you provide it with a unit, which in this case is seconds. Uh, and you provide the content that it should display. So this is kind of, again, used to illustrate how you do things in Compose. Uh, you don't specify exactly how things will look in your component, you specify the behavior. And in this case, the behavior is that you want something that keeps track of, uh, of seconds. Um, so as you remember from previously in the slides, I use the mutable state of uh, to get a state that Compose can observe. And then I use the remember keyword to make sure the value is remembered across recompositions. But then I have to actually make sure that I tick these, these seconds every second. Uh, so for that, I decided to use a side effect. So I put it inside the launched effect block. And this block is going to run forever. Uh, so while it's true, it's going to recalculate the number of elapsed seconds and then delay for one second. And it's going to keep doing this. Because it's a, it's a launched effect, Compose will actually dispose of this thing. It's a coroutine, and it will, be, will get disposed as soon as this element leaves the UI tree. So it's actually safe to do something like this. It will be disposed in a safe way. And when the elapsed time seconds, elapsed time since has changed, and we use this in the content, the content function that we provided as an argument. That means uh, Compose will automatically re-render re the content we put inside the elapsed view um, every second. So it's kind of a nice way to do things. And I will show where it's used later. Um, then we have the profile photo, which is quite, quite a simple thing. Uh, it takes uh, a photo resource uh, and it applies a rounded corner shape. So because we have multiple places uh, where we show the basic employee information, like for example, in this case, we have the list with the role and the name and so on. Um, we have the same basic information here, although it's slightly different. We also display the number of seconds the view has been opened. But it makes sense to build a component out of this. So I, I built something called uh, the basic uh, employee uh, info view component. So uh, it has a row and it has these columns and some texts. And if the employment date is not null, it's going to add the elapsed time view so that we just built. We pass in the date. And then we uh, just put inside the Lambda the text that is going to update. Uh, then we have the rounded card view. Because we have this rounded kind of shape uh, on the card, both inside the list view and inside the detail view, it makes sense to make a component out of this as well. So there is a built-in uh, composable function called card, and we just do this to kind of get rid of some boilerplate, so we can just use our rounded card component all over the place, and it will be the correct appearance. So we have now what we need for the uh, employee uh, view, uh, which is displayed inside of the list. <coughs> 
So it's, uh, it's super simple now to piece together the stuff that we already have with a rounded card and the basic employee info view. Um, we do something interesting here. We use the on globally position modifier. And this is a modifier built into Compose that will, every time this UI is being laid out, uh, we can receive the coordinates for this view on screen. And that's kind of the, one of the challenges with Compose. I mean, in, no, in the normal world, you would be able to, at any time, iterate through the UI tree uh, and pick out a specific component and its coordinates. But you can't really do it in Compose in this declarative model. You have, but there is this uh, other mechanism that you can use instead. So when your view has been positioned, you can save the coordinates somewhere in a safe place. And this is what I do in order to enable our animation from the list to the full screen mode. The actual list itself is quite simple now. Uh, we basically just use a lazy column, and Compose will take care of building a list that we can scroll and rendering each item as needed. So now for the employees screen. Uh, this is kind of the, the main screen. Uh, it's initialized with a view model, and we don't really have to go into exactly how that works. It's not so interesting. Everyone is familiar with view models or something like it. But anyway, the view model has a flow that is a Kotlin coroutine flow of list items. So it's declared like this a flow of a list of list items. But it could be anything. This isn't Compose related as such. It, it just, you can observe anything. And this is one of the many reactive types of reactive streams that you could observe. So not a, not a Compose concept as such. It could be RxJava or something. But the way we turn this uh, Kotlin coroutine flow into a state that Compose can observe, it's by using the collect as state function. So that turns it from a Kotlin coroutine flow into a Compose state that Kot, uh, Compose can observe. I also observe something uh, that I won't go through in detail, but I have uh, built a custom class uh, called Employee Details Animation State. And that one simply keeps track of uh, if I am currently animating from uh, list to full screen or uh, whether I am animating backwards again, or uh, whether a specific list of item has been selected or not. Then I have the scaffold that I showed you earlier. I have a column with a settings panel and a box. Uh, and I have the list view. And then if an item has been selected on the, in this custom class that I just mentioned, then I do something a bit interesting. So the class that I mentioned, it exposes something called a target rect. And this is a rect, so of course a rectangle with bounds. Um, and I make sure that this class updates its state whenever we should expand to full screen or collapse to the list view. So that one is the, that class is the one that keeps track of the coordinates that I sent to the when I intercepted the on globally positioned uh, event. So the nice thing about this is the animate rect as state. So as I mentioned, it's part of Compose. It animates values inside the rectangle. It doesn't animate anything on screen directly, but it animates the values inside the rectangle. And again, I can specify a custom uh, animation spec. In this case, it's the same tween algorithm that I mentioned before that will kind of do it in a nice and slow way where the animation slows down towards the end. But now I have a rect. How do I turn it into you know, actually moving the, the card or resizing the card? Well, I made, made an ex, an ex, a Kotlin extension function on the rect class that turns it into a modifier that I can later pass in to the full screen card to kind of change its size. So what it will do, it will do some uh, uh, compose magic. It will create a new modifier 
it will set the offset of this modifier to the coordinate that we want to have, as well as the size that we want to have. And then I simply paint the employee details view on top of uh, the, um, the existing screen. Uh, and since I passed the modifier uh, that I just created, it will automatically have the correct offset and size. So uh, what about the employee details view? I didn't mention everything about it. So it shows you the number of seconds the view has been open and updates uh, like this. So how do we keep track of the number of seconds that the view has been, has been showing? Um, it's the same thing that I mentioned before. Uh, mutable state initialized uh, with the local, current local date time, uh, the remember keyword, uh, and then uh, storing it in a val. Uh, and passing it to the elapsed time view, just like we did uh, in the other example um, in the, uh, with the employ employment seconds being displayed. So I want to do a, a bit of a summary. Uh, Jetpack Compose is the new official UI toolkit for Android. And JetBrains Brains maintain, maintains versions for desktop and web as well. Uh, Compose is based on using pure functions uh, that emit UI state. And if you need to have any kind of side effects, you need to take special care. care. You own the UI state and not the components. Uh, and you want to describe the UI as if you were building it from scratch every time, uh, as a function of the state that it depends on. Uh, you can accomplish quite a lot with very small effort, uh, and you can adopt Compose in a, in a piecemeal way, where you just uh, create some new composable functions and you put them inside an Android view or vice versa. Uh, it's very fun and easy to get started, and, and for me certainly, uh, Compose and Kotlin as a combination has made it a lot more fun uh, to, build, uh, to build apps or just building UIs in general. So I kind of look back on those uh, earlier days of older UIs like Swing and AWT uh, and, and through this um, um, journey with Android, uh, which is, uh, requires a lot of work and I can see that it's, it's so much easier now. Um, and, and although Compose is quite new, uh, it's already quite solid. Uh, we use it in many of the apps that I, I showed you in one of the slides. Uh, I'm not sure, we have a few minutes left, right? Yeah. So we could take some questions, and, and if there are any more, more questions, you can come and find me uh, or come to our booth at the top floor on the balcony. And there's a bit of more code that I haven't shown, shown you as well because it didn't feel as relevant uh, in the Compose world, but it could still be interesting and it's, it's on GitHub. Uh, all right, so uh, does anyone have a question? Sure. Right, yeah, I guess it's kind of evolving these best practices that we're doing. Uh, when I have played around with this, I have uh, used a single activity and a single uh, uh, fra fragment, and uh, as far as I have seen in the code that we use in the apps that I mentioned, we've done it pretty much the same way. But it's, it's, it's kind of a mix for legacy reasons as well. But there's the nice thing about Compose, I think, is that the Google's new navigation component, which is a common framework for uh, supporting navigation throughout Android apps. It has support for navigating between composable functions, which I think is, is quite appealing. So I, I guess that kind of points to a, a future where maybe, maybe we should be using just uh, composable functions completely and forget about activities and fragments. <laughs>
Sure. So, so, so Jetpack Compose doesn't really require any specific version of Android that I, as I recall. Maybe, maybe there is some lower uh, threshold somewhere, but it's it's certainly in that case uh, very, uh, very, very old. So, uh, the the apps that we build they they support very old Android releases, uh, and Compose works uh, for those um, apps. So, I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, it doesn't really, it's not like in the iOS world where I think uh, if you want to use something like Swift UI, you have to kind of have a more modern version of the OS as well. That's not really how it is with Compose uh, since it's its own library that you bundle with the app. There could still be like a, some minimum, I'm not sure. Yep. Right, yeah, uh, uh, so the question was whether we need to use something called run on UI thread, uh, which of course is a common practice in many of these GUI libraries. Um, and you don't really do it in Compose, and the reason is because um, you're not really supposed to programmatically modify the UI anyway. And you can't really do it. The only way that you can modify the UI is by modifying some state that the UI is declared to kind of be based on. So uh, that's why it's not an issue. Uh, because if your state is updated, regardless of whether the state has been created through a coroutine flow or, or XJava or, or with this built-in construct like mutable state of, regardless of which one is used, Compose will kind of catch the change and update the UI. So that's why you don't need to do the run on UI thread. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned Swift UI. So how uh, being an iOS developer need to try to talk to both? How is the transactions between these two platforms to be affected by uh, the Jetpack Compose? It, seem, it seems to be much easier. If you have written something in native in Swift, don't you exactly almost control C control? Not really, but much easier now. So, it, so is your question whether it becomes easier to kind of reuse? Yeah, that's reusable yeah. here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on Swift UI, although I have played with it a little bit. And as far as I can see, and just like you mentioned, it's, it's quite similar to Compose. Uh, it's the same principle. It looks a little bit different. Um, we haven't really used, like we haven't leveraged that similarity yet uh, to make it easier to you know, build for both iOS and Android, for example. Uh, but I know that we have some designers that think it's very interesting with Compose, and they think they might be able to get more involved more easily in the kind of bridge the gap between design and, and development. You know, maybe they can write Compose code as designers, for example, uh, with some help from developers. So it's it feels like it's it's exciting because it makes it easier for everyone to understand. Certainly much easier than in the Android world, uh, the XML files that we have used in the past, at least. Uh, do we have time for any more questions, or is, are we done? Yeah, one last question. Okay, one last question, if there is one. Okay, so no more questions. So well, thank you so much for listening.